Good morning, everyone. As I'm talking about healthcare, and uh, there is the longest Oxford study going on since 80 years, and it found out what makes health and happiness. It's a social context. So I want you to stand all up and, and just hug your partner next to you uh, before I start. Just I'll stand up. <laughs> I'll stand up and just give a hug before I start. Because this is... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh. So, so I can I can talk about technology, but human contacts um, are the indicator and social contacts that make happiness. And that study that is still ongoing, and we have one participant here in the room that is part of that study. Um, uh, social contacts is that what um, truly makes uh, happiness and at the end health. Um, I'm going to talk about three topics, and I always find it inspiring to be at a platform, like, platform like this or an event because Robert inspired me yesterday. Uh, I changed my title, so I'm going to first start to uh, do an introduction about the personal experience I had in Africa, and then I'm going to start very fast going on what the art of possible with AI in healthcare. And then um, later I'm going to start thinking about how do we apply that in our European value and healthcare system. Um, so, but let me first start talking about my experience that was five years ago in Africa. I was sent out with the corporate citizenship team from IBM and I was very excited. I was going to all different uh, ministries of health in Africa and then I started discovering that in Africa um, there is no infrastructure. Um, some countries, they don't have any labs, um, then they don't have debt registers. These people come with a different name to the hospital. Um, and to build up a cancer register to collect data, well, you need an identificator. That, that wasn't even possible. Uh, there was no infrastructure available. And as they are adopting to our lifestyles, Africans, cancer is becoming a real burden. And as you can't manage it, um, you can't or measure it, you can't manage it. So there are no campaigns, vaccination campaigns for HIV vi virus. Um, and that's the most um, common cancer. It's cervical cancer. Um, and cancer in sub-Saharan Africa is causing 60,000 women that in an average have 8 to 10 children uh, that die. And if you know that uh, cervical cancer is caused by an HPV infection um, and we have a vaccine for that, then I call this a tragedy. And then um, I was very frustrated. A pap smear test to actually test um, um, an infection is 20 US dollars. But if you don't have pathologists, as you can see in all these dark colored countries, uh, that's where you have less than one pathology, pathologist in the country. Uh, like in Niger, they have two pathologists for 18.8 million inhabitants. Um, and then it's like, okay, what do I do? Like, um, I was very frustrated. I gave a negative report. It's like, I think we can put that, uh, the idea of, of building cancer registries as we do it in Western worlds aside because it's not going to work. And I left that, that, that task or that, that um, project with the question, okay, what can we leapfrog? Can we use Africa to leapfrog? And I'm going to come back to that question later. Um, but first, I'm going to show you a bit what, um, or give you a journey, of a very fast journey. I think I have 50 slides in, in a short time that I will present on what actually is happening. And I come back to that example from pathology. Um, if you look at pathology, pathology is, um, or pathologies is actually a large image repository that looks at patterns. Of course, he reads the records, but uh, the more he trains himself, the better he can see these patterns and can diagnose out of the pathology images he sees. There is a problem with pathologies because half of the pathologies are worse as average. Well, that's with all physicians. <laughs> that is not rocket science, but that's the problem in healthcare. You can have a private health insurance, you can have access to expert knowledge, but you can have also somebody who has less expert knowledge. Expertise is not evenly distributed in healthcare. Um, so that's one of the main challenges that we have in healthcare, that expert knowledge is not available in all areas and it's not available for everyone. Then um, humans have as well um, are a black box in some sense. Physicians define medical guidelines and these medical guidelines are defined by experts based on literature and they decide which literature is actually put in that guideline. I don't know why he took that decision. It's a black box, so they have bias and they have cognitive and in case of a pathologist or radiologist, they have visual um, limitations. So I did some research and I said like, okay, what can we use as humans to extend or overcome these visual limitations? 
perhaps not cognitive. And I then found that birds actually, I go back, uh, birds have actually a much more wider spectrum on looking at colors because they are always looking from distance on preys and they have a way better visual cap capacity as humans have. And then I found this weird study that actually they trained pigeons to look at these pathology images. So they trained pigeons to watch at these images that were mammographic screenings. Um, and then they looked at if uh, these images had cancer, they got food, it's a Pavlov technique, uh, and they were trained that way. And over a, a course of, of four weeks, they got an accuracy of 86%. And if you then put 16 pigeons together, the accuracy rose to 99%. I call this massive parallel pigeon computing. Um, and, and it's strange because uh, we, we, this is only about pigeons and we think that humans or pathologists are so much better, but it shows that some things that are limitations, if you extend that and, and you just change that, that you can do things differently. Well, nobody is talking about pigeons taking over the world and, cr and losing jobs. <laughs> Um, so I don't see this discussion happening because we're not afraid of pigeons, but we are afraid of AI. Um, but pigeons can do a better job in radiology and in pathology. They probably don't scale as much because you have a shitty uh, problem at the end. Um, but that's what you see. And so what actually is technology doing, exponential technology? It's up about extending our limits, our extending our limits of processing information, about looking at things, and, and actually what it does is it, creates, or it gives us the capacity to become a superhuman. Uh, and that's what technology for me does, and es especially in healthcare. We have a lot of limits, and we need to use technology that allows us to smell. There is technology that can uh, smell cancer or can out of breath differentiate between an ulcer and a, and a tumor. Uh, there is technology that allows us to see. There is technology that allows us to hear better and way better than humans do or process information. So, Technology is not something we have to fear about, it's just about an extension of ourselves. Um, and I go a bit in these exponential technologies. Um, this is actually um, an algorithm that you can use, or uh, it's a microscope that looks at your own sperm, and you can count your sperm, you can look at your fertility, so you can start using the um, CMOS processor or sensors on your phone for doing a basic lab test. Uh, this is exponential, this is growing in terms of resolution. Uh, over time, we will have capacities to use that phone and do all kind of uh, lab tests with that phone. Um, processing computing, quantum computing, okay, we have to reprogram everything. The algorithms that we have on quantum can't be used, but quantum is there. Uh, we're probably going to reach the 50 qubit level this year, and that's going to probably change everything. Um, and there is um, a lot of buzz around quantum, but uh, it's there. It is, um, it is it's available on the cloud, you can use it. IBM has launched it, uh, Google has launched it, other institutes uh, in Europe, uh, and I hope these as well uh, will get access. Another exponential technology, as we talked about today, is AI, but as well data. Data gets new quality, and this is, a, I love this image, because this image is what happens when you have suddenly access to continuous glucose monitoring data. So normally a diabetes patient, he used to take a few samples a day, but now you have sensors that you wear the whole time. And if you combine it with genomic information, you see that you don't have type 2 diabetes, but type 2 A, B, C. So you get a more granular view and you start creating new knowledge. And new knowledge means that you create new therapies out of that knowledge that you get. Um, but the problem is that um, we, as everything grows exponential, we don't think exponential. And I think that's what we do as well, what we try to do with Future IO is educate as well people on exponential thinking. We are not good, we are very good in hyping that what's gonna come next year, but we're not really good in uh, defining what's gonna happen in 10 years. Yesterday, uh, I think it was Mani who went 14 years back and he said, oh, we were on a map, on a paper map, and then well, now we're ordering taxis that are using a GPS and everything is there. That's 14 years. Well, imagine in 10 years with what's there, out there on technology, what's gonna happen. We can't just imagine it. Um, and I'm not gonna go deep into this, but um, I, I try to always look at, okay, if we want to define the future, I try to look in, there's a very good um, a paper, it's called the AI Index from Stanford, it's published every November, and then you see all the, the evolution in AI performance, uh, it, it's, it, 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 there is just since we started or woke up out of the um, AI winter sleep, things have been evolving at all levels. This is from Stanford Squad, uh, 100,000 questions or 500 articles. Um, in November 2016, 
um, computers were underperforming and they had an accuracy of 74%. In January, a team of Alibaba overperformed on humans. That's just in a time span of one and a half years. These things are evolving. That technology is about question answering, which is very related to healthcare. It's losing NLP, natural language processing. So we see all these things out there. And I, I always use this example, CAPTCHA was a tool that, where we had to prove that we were humans. And, and I hate these things because I was not good at being a human because sometimes I give in that number and it's wrong. But now algorithms are overperforming on humans. So CAPTCHA that actually was a tool to prove that you are a human has been, um, um, has been um, how do you say, like overperformed by an algorithm. So, and this is one of the most fascinating things. Um, does anybody know what this is? Like, of course, we know what this is, but what is this? This is the reproduced image out of MRI information. And, and so we're starting to use deep learning in combination with functional MRIs, and we're starting to see out of the MRI, we can start seeing what he sees. And, and that is fascinating because we can start seeing into the brain what we see and what we think, and the same thing is happening on a dream level. Um, so even deep learning is entering into the functional MRI, and we're starting to do more research on the brain. And this is what happened only in two years. Uh, Beat Captcha, as I said, they are really good at lip reading. You can go on uh, on these things and it's keep on evolving. And um, there is an evolution I haven't seen uh, being in technology for 20 years. I haven't seen this happening in any time of my career, in my 20 years. And this is because deep learning is, is not a linear progression. It is, it is always a, a sum of the sum of what we have done. And this is what makes it very much different. Um, and, and this is why, where I don't, I have a lot of discussions with physicians, with doctors, politicians, and they say, well, we're gonna go back to our winter sleep. Um, um, uh, we have all these challenges. Uh, but th I think this part, uh, it's, it's always a sum, and, it, and the, the new deep learning algorithm is greater than the sum of the other parts that we had before. So if we look at, and yesterday, um, I think it was, uh, my colleague from Future, uh, Oste, uh, uh, Pascal, who uh, talked about the, uh, there was money as well, about the gaming. Well, we did it with uh, Watson, Jeopardy, and AlphaGo was mentioned. So I'm going to go into gaming. My first game that I played was Pong. Um, so I looked into studies, um, and I said, like, where do you start, algorithms start overperforming on physicians? Because if it, uh, being a doctor or being a physician, it's not that you know the single truth. Like it's it's not a binary you answer. You build up a differential diagnosis with a probability. Um, uh, healthcare is not an exact science. Um, so in dermatology, which is quite logical, that we start there. We're looking at images. Um, algorithms are overperforming on humans, on dermatologists, in pathology on specific cancer tissue. Uh, the algorithms are overperforming, um, but not as good as the 16 pigeons, uh, but still they are overperforming on humans. Uh, diabetes, retinopathy screening mentioned as before. Um, algorithms are overperforming. This is why IDX got the first approval of the FDA two weeks ago to automate, not augment, to automate diagnostic. It is an automation. It is not doctor or physician and the algorithm. It is allowed through the FDA to automate diagnostics. It's the first time. And, and, and um, Abramov, who is actually the founder of IDX, he said, like, I want to I wanna not see these patients for these screening programs. I want to have more contact with them, and I want to really find the value of my conversations and, and, and distribute my time on, on other human things. Punomia x-rays, 92%. Then if you look into electronic health records, and then you put deep learning algorithms on there, um, and, and this is really interesting because um, they compared it with the golden um, standard, uh, which is evidence-based medicine, and the, uh, they compared it with the um, uh, guidelines of the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association. And what you actually can see is that, <laughs> that uh, these deep learning algorithms, without understanding anything of that data, is that they find 22 more data points to predict um, events that could lead to death, and they would have, on that data set, we'd had 380,000 patients, they would have saved 350 lives. Uh, you can't apply this into, it, it is a study, but that shows in which direction it's going. And then suddenly these things are doing things that we couldn't do before. So they're making, I call them stupid devices, smarter. Um, and I'm wearing an Apple Watch. Apple Watches have been, together with Cardiogram, a startup, they have been um, looking into how to use that data. And the most um, 
curious thing is that you can start looking at hypertension and you use that quality of data very differently without having a rotator cuff. It is not as accurate as the rotator cuff, but um, continuous data and out of messes and putting that together with deep learning allows us to create new insights. Um, and, and this is, you, you read nearly on a weekly basis reports of people that get alerted by the uh, Apple Watch and being sent to the hospital uh, or went to the hospital and actually saved their life because they got an alert through that watch. Uh, I think, I don't know if it's going to be in the next generation, but in one of the next generations, there's going to be a glucose monitor on your watch. These things are going to evolve. It's exponential. Um, it's going to collect more data. These things are going to become smarter. Um, and Rottenberg, who is actually um, uh, uh, one of the brightest minds I know, um, he was the one that um, uh, uh, developed a DNA sequencer chip. He, he, he now developed uh, an ultrasound device for $2,000 uh, with AI inside. And you can use it at home. I don't know if Apple is going to allow it uh, to be a medical device because then you have liabilities. Um, but for $2,000, this device is available. So we get a decentralization of diagnostics. Retinopathy. Mark, what yes? Is but ingested? No, no. This is it ingesting medical AI. Uh, ingesting medical AI. The device is stupid and gets smarter because we uh, uh, augment it with AI. Yeah. So. This was you <laughs> no, because, because we do have then you would have ingesting your watch. You don't do that either. So, <laughs> so you would not ingest your watch. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Um, so retinopathy screening. Now what you can see is a non-invasive. Non-invasive means it can be done by a nurse. It doesn't have to be, uh, you can do it at home. And then you see it was used for retinopathy screening, uh, as, as mentioned before. But now the very promising thing is that probably we can also use it to predict Alzheimer. And they, in a study was mentioned perhaps 20 years before you can even see the symptoms of having Alzheimer. Um, so all these things, data, sensors, and AI combined are creating new possibilities to diagnose very earlier. Even voice. I always have these discussions about data protection in healthcare. And I said, well, you know what? The Deutsche Telekom is, and the Telefonica are probably the biggest health brokers on data because voice became a diagnostical tool. Um, you can look at all kinds of mental diseases, uh, Parkinson, schizophrenia, sleep detection, and we can start looking into voice, but we as humans can't. Um, and, and this is very scary because how do you protect that? Do we build algorithms in our phone that actually modulate our voice that we can't detect it anymore? How do you protect that? I don't know. I have no answer for it. But this is being used in air traffic control, sleepness detection out of the voice. Is this person going to fall asleep? He gets an alert. Um, sometimes this would be good for some presentations as well. Um, in 2027, um, I, s I, I make a prediction because I used to do this in the past, but I never went public with it. But I made a prediction. I said, like, in, t in 10 years or 9 years from now, I think algorithms are going to overperform on physicians in 80% of all classified diagnoses. Um, if you, there was a very good paper as well that actually looked and they asked uh, 650 um, experts on AI that spoke on the most um, important conferences and published papers. And, and, and they asked, when is surgery going to be automated? And they think, think it, that is going to happen in 30 years. So, and I recently had a conversation with somebody who just inherited a private hospital group. And I said, like, did you ever thought of the question, what are you going to inherit to your children in 30 years? It's going to be a robotic company. It's going to be an AI company. But it's not going to be your orthopedic surgery clinic anymore. Um, so that's a huge impact. So does it mean AI is going to destroy us? Um, and then I'm coming back to that what Manny said yesterday um, on the moment when Gary Kasparov said, uh, well, um, since 1996, humans got destroyed. But that's not the case because there is the center model. Well, center, half man, half horse. And we can choose then uh, which part we are. But I, I prefer to be on top of the body. Uh, but um, there is something in, it's called freestyle chess. And what they saw with the freestyle chess is that amateur chess players, together with computers, not supercomputers, were beating on these machines. And they still do. Um, and that is a very interesting model, because I think that's what, what, what combines us, intuition, judgment, flexibility, together with that what computing does really well, is that what we need to do. And, and I found this study in healthcare from Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and Harvard Medical School, that actually when you combine pathology algorithms with humans, 
that you get an accuracy of 99.5% versus the uh, human 87% and the algorithm 92. So you augmented it. And, and this is what we need to do in healthcare. It's not um, man versus algorithm, as I showed before. It is a human and algorithm against disease. And that's the future of our healthcare. We need to solve healthcare in, to in, in that sense that we have to eliminate disease. And there was a conference three weeks ago in New York and, and, and a Goldman Sachs analyst asked, is that a viable business model curing disease? But I'm not going to go in too deep to that, but um, that is what is the question we need to ask uh, in the industry. Um, and coming back to my quote, I mentioned classified diagnosis. What is classified? Yes, because classified, because healthcare is a bit like the the saga of the blind and the four blind and the elephant. Like, um, you have four blind, you put them on an elephant, this is, says it is a wall, that one says it's a tree, that one says a rope, that one says a spear, and, if you, and, and nobody says it's an elephant, but put this on healthcare. That's your dermatologist, that's your urologist, that's your orthopedic surgeon, and that's your dentist, and nobody says you are human. Um, and, and so I think when we look at AI and healthcare, we should not try to replicate this. Um, and that's what actually the biggest promise is for me, is the area of precision medicine. We are starting to understand, based on big data, what actually influences our organs on a cell level, and then we can measure our genomics, but all multi-omics layer that we can correlate. These are big data sets, and we can start applying AI on it, and then finding new biomarkers on proteins that predict diseases way earlier, and we're going to come into a stage where that's from Leroy Hood, where we're not going to spend our money as soon as we have clinical science. We're going to spend our money uh, perhaps years earlier where we can still influence the whole pathway of disease. And that's where the whole aging discussion comes from, because uh, some people think that aging is as well a pathway of disease. And if you start understanding system biology, that's going to completely change healthcare. And some people predict that, well, um, um, in 10 years or 15 years, I don't care if it's 10 or 15, but it will uh, eventually happen that we will have to rewrite the whole textbook of medicine. And that's based on AI. So with IBM did some, some developments there. You can have like on a fraction of a blood, you can measure 50 proteins, and then you can analyze that. Uh, it's not going to be the tricorder for our Star Trek facts, but I think the future could be that you have a dispenser, you test your blood or a specific sample, and you get your smoothie or you get your tablets, and then you stay healthy. Well, that's a bit oversimplified, but this is an actual startup from San Diego that actually does that, based, of course, on blockchain. Um, but um, um, this is what I think the future is. I think it's an espresso machine that actually that, that proves you something or 3D prints medication and um, keeps you healthy. So now coming to the most important part, how do we put it into value? And um, again, Robert, so the question, <laughs> what can we do now that we never have done before? You, well, you saw all these things. We could have known that before, but then I saw, I hope the sound is on. Uh, hey, uh, it's the wrong direction. So. When I went back to Africa, or when I came back from Africa, I got introduced to somebody who said, like, in India, there was a doctor who actually created a cancer register for cervical cancer without having pathologists. Um, and I went there, and I never will forget his name. His name is Dr. Dixit. Um, and he um, showed me these images where they applied a kitchen acid on the cervix. And if you do that, you can see a reaction on the HPV virus. And then they showed me this book with 2,000 images. And it's like, how oh, much of these images I have? Now there is a startup that actually does this as a golden standard in Africa. It's not as accurate as the golden standard, but you don't need trained nurses. It's the gold. These things are getting better exponentially, as we know. Um, and it doesn't cost anything. Compared to pep smear, pathologists, you need experts. We leapfrogging. We leapfrogging in Africa on a very different level, using AI, using mobile phone, and we're doing things very different. And we're giving them access to expert knowledge just on a mobile phone. I think this is very promising. Um, and then if you look at healthcare, so that's the biggest question we need to ask. 70%, it's a six trillion industry. Uh, lately, I was in a conversation, I said somebody to me like, healthcare is a tea industry. And I said like, what is a tea industry? It's a trillion industry. And I said like, yes, but 70% of the world population doesn't have access. It's like, do we want to create more, or uh, spend more even in, in the US? I think it's 18% or 90% in the middle of your GDP to support that. I think we need to look at things very differently. And then um, I we have to ask the question, what is technology doing to our health? Is healthcare a, a human right? And 
I don't know if you saw Altered Carbon on Netflix. Altered Carbon is a, is a Netflix series, and I saw this sequence, and I got like suddenly, I'm not gonna show it to you. There. Almost there, hang on. Hey, hang on! You have to put it a bit louder, yeah. It's the year 2050, whatever. They have flying cars, everything is like automated. Um, his girlfriend is bleeding to death. This is not gonna stop the fucking bleeding. You need to pay for services. <laughs> I'm sorry, but Miss Ortega has insufficient resources for specialized treatment. She's just gonna let her die? Of course not. We don't turn anyone away. We'll help her as soon as we can. I, um, I just assumed that... Yeah. Please, right this way. Now it's interesting because you see technology is there. There is nobody scanning. There is all kind of technology. There is only one surgeon. There is one robot surgeon. There is no You're nurse. Her, right? Her stack is intact. Dangerous to her sleeve. Her arm is too badly damaged. A weenie to amputate. However, we do offer a wide range of limb replacement models for someone with your considerable financial resources. These are our most popular options. Biomed, gene splice, so clone. I asked myself the question, looking at this, this is completely wrong. Like, you have less resources that you use. Um, you have technology, you have robotics, you have everything there. Every, somebody mentioned it before, technology gets always cheap. I think it was Harald who mentioned that, and it gets always cheaper. If healthcare is going to be technology-based, why is she declined at the entrance of the hospital? I, that's not the future I want. I think AI... Is a, is a very promising technology for our business, and I strongly believe that we can use AI to give everyone access, and we have to open source it. We have to open source AI, medical AI, and liberate that knowledge, and, and we have a direction to choose. The direction at the moment is, in the US, 8 billion on venture capital on um, a, um, digital health startups. That means they want a tenfold return on these investments. That's going to lead for me to the digital privatization in Europe for the core of medicine. I don't see investment in the public. They're all hyping startups. And I ask myself the question, is that really going to lead us to a better future? If we're only going to invest in startups or we need to find public-private partnerships or different models to do this? Because if we're going to surgery, diagnostic, therapeutics, if that's going to be super privatized, do we then end up in that system that we saw in altered carbon? And that's a question I am asking myself and discussing quite a lot. And my pathway is in the other direction. Um, it's a desirable future. Startups are focusing on becoming unicorns. Uh, the purpose is exponential growth. Um, the outcome is a monopoly. Um, it's it's built build, build on private capital. Um, it's closed systems. Facebook has more data on mental diseases uh, as, as any organization. They are not liberating it. Oh, they have an algorithm to predict suicide. Nice. And they do commercials. You can get a service. That's not the value that is in their data. You can do way more. So for me, that healthcare for all initiative that I started with Future.io in the platform is a desirable future. A desirable future is a future where I want my children and my grandchildren to live in. And it should be available for everyone. It should um, be based on cooperation. It should be open. It should be public. And I think in Europe, that's how we can hack Silicon Valley, using our public institutes and using that knowledge and asking ourselves the question, as Robert said before, look into the future 10, 30 years and then ask yourself the questions. Humans are still better in asking questions than machines. Machines are getting better at giving the answers. Um, but we have to ask the question, how can we use our infrastructure, public infrastructure, the medical knowledge that we have, uh, and um, try to scale our public health care system so it's available for all. And we give access to people in Africa to do diagnostics, and um, we give not only 30% of the world population access to healthcare, but we solve a lot of issues that are causing immigrations and all other things that we have, and I think we have the chance to do so. So with this, I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.